challenges our military faces going into the 21st century are great. Modern day training involves communication between ground troops and aircraft. Range operations involving rifles, missiles, and explosives. Here at Camp Landing, all branches of our military get the training they need to be successful. And law enforcement and firefighters can use the facilities to improve their skills as well. Camp Landing Joint Training Center is the center of gravity for all training in the Florida National Guard. It's also a joint training center, so we train Marines, Navy, regular Army, Coast Guard. But we also train interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational. So Camp Landing is a very active training center. The base has gone through many changes as commanders continued to train their troops through the decades. Although modern day Camp Landing wasn't created overnight, those who witnessed its creation back in the 1940s would say it seemingly was. It took about 22,000 men and women working around the clock for 90 days to create what would become the fourth largest city in Florida, the largest at the time being Jacksonville. Taking a walk through the post, time seems to have stood still as the concrete pillars show visitors the evidence of where the original buildings once stood. In other areas, soda bottles are buried upside down in street lines. But why are these here and who planted them there more than 70 years ago? This is the story of Camp Landing, the Florida National Guard's premier training site. But how did this base come into being? Who was General Blanding? And who were the men and women who built this place? I'm AJ Artley, and I'd like to invite you on a journey into this old post as we explore some of the stories of courage and sacrifice of the literally hundreds of thousands who made their way through here on their way to history. Located 40 miles southwest of Jacksonville, the 73,000 acre post is the Florida National Guard's premier training site. Although it's primarily an Army and Air National Guard post today, it owes its location on the shores of Kingsley Lake to the U.S. Navy's desire to establish a naval air station on the banks of the St. Johns River. In November of 1939, the Florida National Guard handed over the small 900-acre Camp Foster to the U.S. Navy and in return received $400,000 to purchase 30,000 acres just east of Stark. On January 1, 1940, the post got its name in honor of, at the time, Major General Albert H. Blanding, one of Florida's most distinguished soldiers. He graduated from East Florida Seminary, now the University of Florida. Colonel Blanding commanded the 2nd Florida Infantry during the Mexican Border Service in 1916 and 1917. As a Brigadier General, Blanding commanded the 53rd Brigade, 27th Division during World War I. In 1924, he was promoted to Major General and took command of the 31st Infantry Division. From 1936 to 1940, he served as the Chief of the National Guard Bureau while still commanding the 31st. When they decided to established the, the new National Guard training camp, the officers asked that it be named for General Blanding just because of what he had done for the state of Florida and the Florida National Guard, but also what he had done for the National Guard nationally. At his retirement in 1940, he was promoted to Lieutenant General in recognition of his service. The one thing that he was most proud of is the fact that, that his mother was proud of what he had accomplished and that he did not let his mother down in the sacrifices that she made to give him a better future. So now that you know a little bit about the man who the post was named after, let's see how the 30,000 acres got to the 73,000 acres that sits here today. Initially, the contract between the state and the War Department said the post would accommodate one infantry regiment and be ready by July 1st, 1940. As the construction began, the Jacksonville Journal reported 5,000 men would have nowhere else to go but Jacksonville on their off time while the Bradford County Telegraph reported 10,000 men might be encamped. Although the numbers seemed like a high estimate, the locals didn't realize what was about to happen. In the middle of 1940, the War Department announced General Blanding's old command, the 31st Division of National Guard troops from Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, would be called to active duty for one year of training, effective November 25, 1940. And they were coming to Camp Blanding. But that wasn't all the War Department had planned. The 43rd Infantry Division of National Guard troops from Maine, Vermont, Connecticut, and Rhode Island were also called to active duty for one year, effective February 24th, 1941. And we were to go somewhere 
for a year training. We didn't know where at that time, but we soon find out that we're gonna to go to Camp Blanding in Florida. With two divisions now coming to Camp Blanding, the War Department would need to lease additional land. By the time the federal government was done acquiring real estate in the 1940s, the camp would become more than five times the size the original plans called for in September of 1939, which brought the total acres available for military training to more than 152,000. The construction company, Starrett Brothers and Ekin, were given the daunting task of completing facilities for 40,000 troops in just 90 days. But if any company was going to be able to get this done, Starrett Brothers and Ekin would. After all, their fame was earned by building the Empire State Building in just under 15 months instead of the 18 months they were given. For this job, they would need 7,000 carpenters just to begin the process. But nowhere near that number was available, so they adopted several innovative solutions. The first would be experienced carpenters would work alongside beginners so they could learn by doing. Then they set up a system to pre-cut sections of buildings at the sawmill and lumberyard. For example, the standard mess hall could be cut to size at the lumberyard in about 10 minutes and erected at the camp on its foundation in 25. Some of the local farmers said landowners had barely enough time to round up their cattle before government contractors appeared to clear and burn trees on the sites where barracks would be built. The work was non-stop. They worked three shifts a day, seven days a week to build facilities for 60,000 troops, a hospital with 2,800 beds, 23 chapels, four bowling alleys, a 15,000 square foot gymnasium, and eight movie theaters. Although most of what remains of these buildings are just concrete foundations, Camp Blanding put a modern day cover over this old movie theater's foundation near Chipley Street in Quincy Avenue. So today, units training here can use it for briefings. Altogether, about 22,000 workers were hired for the construction phase. And once it was finished, the camp would need about 4,000 civilians to help run the place. Well, I worked in fiscal. Marjorie Driggers worked here with her husband. And he was uh, head of the quartermaster corps where he hired people to work at Camp Blanding. Two of them were her younger siblings. So between the 11th and 12th grade, he said, come on out and then just tell the guy when you get a physical that you're 16 or 18, so whatever it was, I told him. And anyway, I was put to work making 75 cents an hour and that I had been making about that much a day working, so I was real happy. The summer of 1940, All right. I graduated from high school in Lake Butler and uh, came to Camp Blanding to work for the summer, and then I went to college up in Tallahassee, FSCW, when it was just girls. <laughs> Not only did Mr. Driggers hire people to work here, he also found an unusual way to make sure they made it to work every day. We bought an old, an old hearse under the seats on the sides. We fixed the places for them to sit under the windows. And then in about 10 on each side, or maybe more, I don't exactly remember, but it was a car full. So with about 4,000 civilians and more than 60,000 troops, Camp Blanding was often referred to as the fourth largest city in Florida. Then in September of 1942, the camp saw the arrival of a new group which called Camp Blanding home. It was already the largest military base in the state, but now it would become the largest German POW camp as well, holding up to 1,200 Germans at a time. And at just 15 years old, Bill McGill found himself in charge of a German detail delivering food to the mess halls. I wasn't old enough to get a driver's license and I had three Germans that worked on the truck. And these three Germans, one could speak English and the other two, of course, could speak only German. And uh, we would go to the mess halls and they would un unload the uh, material there and the sergeant would check it off. In 2015, the Florida Channel produced a special and spoke with some former German POWs about their time in the camps. One of them spoke about the food McGill's detail delivered. The food was good, and we had former cooks 
Oh, sometimes American officers came in and had our food because good German, Sauerbraten and, and things like that. While in the camps, they were put to work on many different jobs. They worked in the motor pool fixing vehicles, off post picking local produce, and some worked in the bakeries on post. We got paid 10 cents an hour, 80 cents a day, so that was good pay. <laughs> I could go to the canteen and buy a bottle of beer uh, for 10 cents. They even had leisure time they could spend inside or outside of their barracks. They could learn English or spend time playing soccer. This model at the Camp Blanding Museum shows visitors what the POW camp looked like. Because just like most of the buildings the Americans used, the only things left standing are the concrete foundations where the latrines once stood. There are some items here that are unique to the POW camp though. The Germans used Coke bottles to line their walkways. They said that on moonlit nights, the bottles would give off a reflection to help light their way. The bottles, you would only see it, see it in both sides. Yes. Mr. Metzroth is now an American citizen living in Stewart, Florida, and brought his wife and one of his three sons with him on his latest visit back to the POW camp. He drew these sketches from memory and donated them to the Camp Landing Museum. That was my hut over here, number four. And every one of us got uh, a toothpaste and a toothbrush and uh, some sh shaving stuff, you know, as on our beds. The first time we had the real beds, you know. I was living for, for a month already without any beds. Well, I had heard stories, you know, as a child growing up and, and um had seen some photographs of my father having come here, you know, and showed me where the foundation stones were. Uh, and I'd always wondered what it was like. Um, and I had no idea that it was in such a rural part of Florida. Uh, and so by coming here and walking the same walk that my father walked, it was actually pretty emotional. One of the first color centerfold that the Life magazine had, these green grass and a few nice pretty nurses walking around. And at the bottom it said, this is Camp Landing. Well, boy, that was a place for us. Well, what a disappointment. We saw nothing but acres and acres of white sand, pine trees, and live oak trees draped with the Spanish moss. It looked like dirty dish rags. It was under construction when I knew it. And the guys talked about the sand, 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 you know, and we thought it was natural. <laughs> Although most people thought of Florida as a vacation destination, Camp Blanding wasn't. It was built to train entire divisions for the possibility of going to war. The 31st and 43rd were the first two of nine divisions that would pass through here on their way to history. So they spent the year of 1941 conducting maneuvers. Some of the training they would go through taught them how to fight in cities and towns. For this, a village was constructed and their mission was to take the village. To make it more realistic, they brought in people from the surrounding areas to play the role of villagers. And if that wasn't realistic enough, when the battle began, they had the streets rigged with real explosives. As they worked to cut through barbed wire, planes would fly over, dropping beer cans with small explosives inside them. Then once they took the town, they'd have to defend it. So they trained on setting up barricades with anything and everything they could find, even cars. The training they were going through was rough and dangerous. When they low crawled under the barbed wire, they were instructed to stay low, not just because it was the proper way of doing it, it was because the machine gun was firing live bullets. With all of this activity, there was bound to be injuries, and that wasn't a problem because the post hospital would become one of the largest in the country. I'm thinking it's a shame that the buildings aren't still here because uh, being a genealogist and a lover of history, and I know how much they meant to my dad, he was in charge of all of the medical facilities. Mostly I remember him talking about the miles and miles and miles he used to walk every day when he was making his rounds. In my mind's eye, I'm trying to, to envision what was here. Um, the buildings, the, the buildings full of men in hospital beds. The hospital admitted about 21,000 people a year. They served the troops at Blanding and any troops in the surrounding areas from Jacksonville to Gainesville and their dependents. They even had a maternity ward. 
And it's, it's awesome when people ask me, where were you born? And I get to say, Camp Landing, Florida. So as the hospital worked to rehabilitate the injured, the training continued. So we passed all the, the necessary tests and we completed our required year's training about the end of November, 1st of December. And we were told that we could go home early, like the 1st of January. On the 7th of December, the Japanese changed all of our plans. President Roosevelt said in a statement today that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, from the air. We were being prepared for war now. In the early part of February of 42, we left Camp Landing and went to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. As the 31st and 43rd left Camp Landing, two more divisions would arrive to take their place. For the next year and a half, the cycle would repeat itself until the last division left in August of 1943. The first replacements were the 36th Division of National Guard Troops from Texas and the 1st Infantry Division, which would be the only regular Army division to train here at Camp Landing. Because most of the follow-on divisions had already gone through some type of training, their time here wasn't as long as the 31st and 43rd. The 1st Division departed after only three months, but that wasn't the shortest time spent here at Blanding. The 29th Division of National Guard troops from Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and D.C. spent just 37 days here in August and September of 1942. As they were leaving, the camp saw the arrival of the 79th Division. It was the first Army Reserve Division to train here. Soon to follow in October was the 30th Division of National Guard troops from North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. When the 79th left in March of 1943, instead of preparing for another old division at Blanding, the camp would witness the creation of an entirely new Army Reserve Infantry Division. On April 15, 1943, the 66th Infantry Division was activated on the parade field, and just two months later, the 63rd Infantry Division of Reservists became the second new division activated at Camp Blanding, and the 9th and final division to train here. Not all of the units that came through here were part of a division, though. Some of them were as small as a 12-man postal unit. The 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment was also created here. Of the 4,500 men who volunteered, only 2,300 met the strict qualifications the commander required. The 508th was later attached to the 82nd Airborne Division and took part in Operation Overlord in June of 1944. Some of the other units were MPs, cavalry, tank destroyers, and engineers, all of them ranging in different sizes and all of them separate from the divisions. But no units were more separate than the 57th Ordnance Company, the 45th Engineer Regiment, and the 97th Engineer Battalion. Like most of America, the U.S. Army continued to follow a policy of segregation during World War II. If you look at the map of the post from 1941, the unit locations were labeled COL, which stood for colored. They had their own PX, movie theater, and they had to travel by bus or truck to Whitmore Lake because they were not allowed to swim at Kingsley Lake. These units would go on to accomplish great things despite the discrimination they faced. The 45th worked on the Lido Road, a vital supply line to General Joseph Stilwell in Burma, which kept American and Chinese troops in the fight against the Japanese. Women also served and trained here in the Women's Army Corps. They filled 37 different jobs from accountants to conducting inventory in the arms room. They were also required to go through some of the same training as the men, and they did it in heels. After the last two divisions left Camp Blanding in August of 1943, the camp immediately became an infantry replacement training center, receiving 5,400 new recruits every three weeks. Upon completion of the 17 weeks of training, soldiers were then assigned to combat units. For the remainder of the war, this was Camp Blanding's primary function. I was a supply soldier for all of Camp Blanding. From the time Mr. Clyde Bell arrived here with the advanced detachment of regular Army troops from Fort Bragg, North Carolina on September 15, 1940, until the end of the war in 1945, more than 800,000 troops would have some type of training here. Training which would prepare them to do extraordinary things, like build a supply road 1,072 miles long, jumping into Normandy at 2.15 a.m. on June 6, 1944, storming Omaha Beach on D-Day, and the bond between them so great, it seemed like nothing could stand in their way or keep them apart. 
he got sick as they were traveling to oh. Italy. When he got out of the hospital, he was supposed to be reassigned to a new unit, but he wanted to get back with his unit. And I hitchhiked a thousand and three hundred miles across North Africa by myself. At 99 years old, Mr. Bell was able to come back to Camp Blanding for a visit. Mr. Towers, also 99, volunteers at the museum and is able to walk on post where the barracks once stood. Sadly, a great number of men who trained here will never return. And because not every member of the nine divisions trained here, it's hard to say just how many Camp Blanding trainees gave their lives for freedom. Altogether, the nine divisions had 22,756 who either were killed in action or died of their wounds. 78,528 wounded. Along with the actual monuments at the museum that serve as a reminder of their service, the concrete slabs and pillars stand as a reminder of where they lived and trained as part of a generation who didn't know when or if they were coming home. Camp Blanding has a significant World War II history that is so important for us to understand and embrace. But you know what? Camp Blanding remains relevant today. The Florida National Guard continues to use Camp Blanding today in many ways the same way as they did in the 1940s. The makeshift village of Plywood is now concrete, which can be used in exercises involving firefighters for search and rescue training. Grenade training is no longer conducted from trenches. The guard now uses the Mark 19 on top of a mound. The parade field, which hosted pass and review ceremonies for entire divisions, is now a launch pad for the UAVs and helicopters. And the hut mints and wooden barracks, which house thousands from all over the U.S., have been replaced with the modern buildings of the Regional Training Institute, where soldiers from all over the U.S. come to be trained in courses like the Combat Lifesaver Course. And U.S. Army civilians from all over the world can take part in the Army Emergency Management Installation EOC course, where they learn how to manage facilities and assets while responding to natural and man-made disasters. Activate our active shooter plan. The vehicle support equipment on standby just in case it's requested by the incident commander. While they train in the Emergency Operations Center, Surf P units work with firefighters and emergency responders on rubble piles to practice the actual hands on skills needed to save lives in scenarios like this. Camp Blanding's really the jewel in the, in the region because out of the whole Southeast region, Camp Blanding is the premier training site. Camp Blanding also plays a role in protecting the environment. The Florida Forest Service works with the National Guard in the spring, setting prescribed burns to help prevent larger fires in times of drought later in the year, while at the same time giving the crews of these helicopters some practice on how to put those fires out. Three, two, one. Some of those fires may have been started like this. And while most people try to avoid lightning strikes, there's a place here where they try to attract them. This is the University of Florida's International Center for Lightning Research and Testing. It's the number one place in the world for trigger lightning research, where students shoot rockets attached to a copper wire into storm clouds trying to trigger a strike. The lab opened in 1996, and because of the research done here, we now have a better understanding of how lightning affects appliances and other items connected to the electrical grid. We also have a better understanding of what lightning does to radio waves and aircraft. The military can use this information to help protect its aircraft and the troops on the ground. With all of these uses, Camp Landing is more diverse than ever, but still stays true to the reason why it was built in the first place. Its number one goal remains the same, to train our military so they can protect our freedoms and our people. While many things have changed here at Camp Landing, there are many things that remain the same like thousands of men and women continue to dedicate their lives to meet the challenges our country faces in the 21st century. This post continues to be that place where they can get that training they need to face those challenges. I'm AJ Artley, and for everyone here at Camp Landing, thank you for watching.